Hey, well, thank you very much. I'm before we begin, let me just share my screen with you all. Uh, and you can see that okay. All right. Um, yeah, so Felicia, thank you. Uh, first of all, it's it's my great honor to be here. I'm absolutely thrilled to have this opportunity. And I'm I must say I'm kind of blown away by the number of people who are here, uh, here, where wherever here is in this in this context. But it's remarkable. I saw uh, as people are coming in, over a hundred people, um, and I think more are still coming in. And one of the reasons that blows me away is that the festival, the ritual that I'm going to talk about today, takes place in a very, very rural part of Japan, uh, where, and I've worked very closely over the years with the people in that community, and they would be absolutely thrilled to know that more than 100 people are, are gathered in this virtual setting to learn about Namahage uh, in, in, you know, through a museum in New Mexico. That would really, really blow their minds and, and be a wonderful thing. I think they'd be very happy about it. Um, so first of all, thank you, Felicia. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you all at, at MOIFA, at the Museum of International Folk Art, for setting this up. And I will say I have I worked with Felicia very early on and didn't have it uh, in the preparation of the museum exhibition. Um, unfortunately, COVID hit before I had a chance to, to visit the museum, but it looks like it's an absolutely fabulous exhibition. I hope we all have time to visit it when things are, are back to normal. Um, so let me just begin. Um, so first, uh, a, a, a shameless plug for my own books, uh, which are on uh, yokai, as you can see, and one of the things, the, the reason I wanted to mention these is that, as Felicia mentioned, I've been doing a lot of research on Japanese monsters and conceptions of the supernatural um, for over two decades now. And I've written uh, quite a lot in, 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 the, in this context on, on yokai, but much of the work that I did for that, much of the material that I used were textual sources. I looked at a lot of old encyclopedias. I looked at newspaper articles. Um, historical documents, uh, collected versions of legends and folk tales and that sort of thing. But while I was doing that initial research, actually way back in 1998, when I first started doing this research in Japan, I was really interested not only in learning about monsters and, and, and supernatural imagery as it appears in text and in images, but how it appears in action. And that's what led me to start research on this thing called Namahage. And Namahage uh, was something I'd heard about and it's a, a ritual or a festival um, that takes place in one part of, of Japan. And back in 1998, uh, I was in Japan doing, doing, starting my research on yokai and I had the opportunity to go visit the festival and I've been visiting it ever since and been involved with the community there and another community that works on a festival uh, slightly different from Namahage, but also related. So I've had a long-term uh, interaction with this very small community, and it's been really wonderful and rewarding. And only now am I really, do I really feel more and more comfortable starting to write about it, <laughs> only in the last several years. Uh, it's really taken a long time to understand it, and I'm still uh, working on understanding it. So today's, today's talk, though, um, whoops, wrong way. Um, is a little bit of an outline of what I'd like to talk about. And it's really just going to be kind of an introduction to this ritual, uh, ritual slash festival. Uh, and there's two different versions of it, which I'll make clear. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about tourism and a little bit about UNESCO and ICH. And uh, in other words, um, give you a sort of broad introduction to what this ritual is, what it looks like. I have a lot of images, so hopefully that'll keep you entertained, um, even if what I say is not all that interesting. But uh, I also want to sort of have in the background some of the bigger questions that I've been trying to think about as I go through and continue this research. One of those is simply how is fear uh, used as a cultural research, a resource, right? So, uh, so yokai, these supernatural creatures, monsters, whatever we want to call them. Uh, and namahage is not necessarily a typical yokai, but, but they draw on something fearful. Uh, they draw on terror of a sort. Um, but in a very particular way, and I'm, I'm wondering how that's used as a kind of affective resource in, in the community. Um, I'm also interested in diversity. So I'll show you um, the community where this takes place. 
It's a very small community, but within that community, there are many, many, many different versions of this same ritual. Uh, and uh, with that in mind, I'm also interested in how things changed and how this ritual, how Namahage has been used as, how this tradition has been used as a kind of cultural resource for revitalizing the community, keeping it uh, alive and active and economically viable as a small community. Uh, and that ties into notions of tourism. So I'll be talking a little bit about tourism and also to what's known as intangible cultural heritage and Namahage's recognition uh, or acknowledgement by a UNESCO, um, on, on a UNESCO list of representative uh, traditions, as it were. So there's a lot in there. I'm not going to express, talk about all this explicitly, but it, uh, hopefully you can keep it in mind as kind of uh, some, some of the background questions. But mostly I'm going to show you a lot of pictures and, and, and describe the uh, ritual itself. So first of all, Namahage ritual uh, takes place in Akita Prefecture. This is what Namahage looked like in action. Um, the, it takes place in one place in Akita Prefecture. I'll show you where that is on a map. It's way up in the north of Japan, uh, in Japan's uh, snow country. It's the, the chilly uh, part of Japan. Um, it takes place only in this one little region called the Oga Peninsula. So I'll use the word Oga to describe that area. It takes place only on New Year's Eve. And on that evening, on New Year's Eve, young men, it's a, a almost entirely uh, sort of organized and, and performed by men, uh, though women are also involved in some ways, but they're not the performers in it. Young men will dress as demons, or I, I wrote here demons, but it's really sort of demon slash deity figures. And essentially they go from house to house, banging on the doors, demanding entrance, ripping open the doors, coming in and scaring the children. Uh, in some ways, it's kind of a, a reverse Halloween sort of thing. But they also are welcomed into the community, into the household by the householders, by the, the family. Uh, they're served uh, some food and drink, and it varies in each little neighborhood, of course, but they're served some food and drink. And they chase the kids around and they yell at them and they implore them not to be lazy even in the winter months to help out around the house and, and participate and to be good kids. And they settle down and have a drink and have some sort of witty repartee with the family. And then they bless the family for the new year, the upcoming year. And of course this takes place on New Year's Eve, which is in so many cultures, a very a transitional moment, right? It's a time of vulnerability and change, a, a rite of passage sort of moment in which you know, every uh, th things take uh, are are felt more deeply and have more power going forward, right? So, so it's at this moment of, of vulnerability and transition that they come in and they drive away the demon. They themselves are demons, but they're driving away the demons of the previous year and welcoming in blessing for the new year. So that's a lot of preface to show you some really interesting images. Um, first. Where is Oga? Oga is way up here, this little peninsula right here. And here's Tokyo here. So it's quite a distance. And historically, I won't talk too much about the history of this, but this was seen for many, many years as kind of a, a peripheral part of Japan. In fact, there's, there's a kind of condescending language in Japan that used to be used as a pejorative label for that part of Japan as like the back of Japan, right? Uh, it's, it's on the periphery, it's far from the metropole, it's far, far from uh, the city. Um, and it still is, it's, it's, you can get there in about five or six hours by bullet train now, but, but in the old days, it was a lot harder to get to. And Oga itself is mostly an agricultural and fishing community. Again, here is um, the peninsula here, here's a close up of it. And one thing uh, you can notice here is that this dark green from, I took this from Google Maps satellites, right? But the dark green here uh, shows there's not much settlement there and it's mo very mountainous. So it's a pretty mountainous, it's dominated by several major mountains and um, Oga itself, the community itself has about 26,000 people, that's all. So it's pretty small in terms of population and it's pretty spread out. And people tend to live in small, um, here's just some images of, 
of the it, in the winter. Um, people tend to live in small sort of communities. This is one of the largest communities uh, called Yumoto, and there happen to be a lot of hotels here. Um, there's hot spring baths here. So this is one of the tourist draws of the area. And for me, this was the first place I ever experienced Namahage. Um, I, I can tell that story later if anybody's interested. But, uh, but when I got there, this was actually in 1998, um, I had the opportunity to see Namahage for the first time in this community. Um, and what I'll stress throughout is that each community, each what's called a shuraku in Japanese in this case, uh, has a slightly different way of performing Namahage. So um, this first experience that I had, uh, I went to this building right here, which is the Kominkan, uh, a kind of a public community center, which happens to be right next to a shrine. Um, and inside the Kominkan, there were uh, items laid out ready for performance. This is on New Year's Eve, about six or 5.30, 6 o'clock in the evening. And you can see these masks laid out here and the various uh, clothing that are, will be used. This is a straw made of rice straw. It's a straw uh, apron coat um, called a uh, kera or a kende. It depends. Uh, there's all sorts of local dialect for this. And here's uh, older men helping younger men get dressed uh, and perform uh, in, in preparation. Uh, th this young man right here was these, these two young men, I think were about 20, 21 years old at the time. This guy was smoking a cigarette, which really scared me. You know, he's, he's in a straw raincoat smoking a cigarette. But, um, and this is a question I often get, and something that's very important. I think historically, it was performed by young unmarried men. So um, maybe from the ages of 16 to 25, 30, but usually no older than that. And it really de depends on the particular community, but that was the general consensus. Things have changed recently for various reasons, and I'll show you some pictures of much older men performing it. But we can see even in this image from 20 years ago, uh, how the older men are, are assisting in the preparation, they're assisting the younger men. And in this case, uh, we have this guy all ready to go with the mask, and they went in pairs of blue and red yokai, uh, blue and red namahage in each group. And they separated and they went outside into the cold. Uh, and again, there's New Year's Eve in a, in a wintry community. And they walk from house to house, bang on the doors, and then run inside and chase the kids around. And here they say things like, are there any crying kids here? I'll eat their ears. Uh, and there's kind of a, a phrase, nagigoe naiga. Uh, I didn't do it very well. I didn't do it. My, my Akita accent is not very good, but, but it's become a kind of uh, phrase that are there any crying kids here, right? Um, and you can see the kids are scared, right? It, it's a lot of fun to watch in a really perverse way, right? But um, there's another kid being scared. And then they'll say things, are there any kids here, bad kids here? I'll take them away to the mountains. Um, I personally, I, I really love this uh, picture because um, one of the things that I find really interesting about the way fear is used here is that fear and fun are kind of inverse sides of the same coin, right? Because here this kid is obviously terrified. Uh, his grandmother is just having the time of her life, right? And it's only because she knows that this is not real. She knows that this is, you know, uh, so-and-so's uh, older brother from the next door dressed up to scare the kids, right? So there's this wonderful dramatic irony that's involved in this. Um, this is this is me uh, back then with my first my first namahage selfie, as it were. Um, so, whoops. Namahage has has been around for a long time. Uh, we don't know how long, in fact, but the oldest written record was from a guy named Sugai Masumi, who was a really interesting um, kind of a samurai medical practitioner and proto-ethnographer who traveled all around the north of Japan and documented it quite brilliantly with written words and also his own pictures. And so he was the first person ever to document Namahage. Uh, and what he writes here, I'll just read it very quickly. He says, deep in the night, lanterns are lit and everybody gathers around the hearth. Suddenly the Namahage come in with high horned masks painted red and disheveled hair of black dyed grass they wear a straw coat called a kera, 
In their hands, they carry small knives and they burst in abruptly yelling, wah, so surprised they cannot cry out. The children say, it's the Namahage and they cling to people and hide behind things. And it's a little hard to see, but the kids are hiding right behind this screen right here. Um, and, and you can see some of the elements that we've already seen in that those brief pictures I, sh I showed you, them running around, they look very similar. And in this case, uh, she seems to be um, giving them some food. So even though this is uh, over um, 200 years old, is that right? Yes, 200 years old. It's very similar in some ways to the way it's still practiced today. Uh, the other thing I wanted to emphasize is the variety. So we saw some masks just now. The mask that's in the exhibition at, the, uh, at MOIFA, at the museum, is a different kind of mask. But every community, every neighborhood, as it were, and some of these shuraku, these neighborhoods, are really, really small. Um, 100 people, 200 people. Some are maybe 1,000 people. It really depends. But each one, and there's up to 60 or 70, depending on how you count them, have their own masks and their own slightly different way of performing this. Here's just a, a bunch of those masks, and I'll look at some more carefully. Um, so in fact, we'll look at the community where these masks come from. It's a place called Ashizawa, uh, which is actually in the, in the center of town, as it were, the sort of business district of this small community of Oga. And the masks there are very distinctive. They're these very large masks. And actually, Ashizawa, to give you a little uh, background, had been, um, people hadn't been all that interested in Namahage for, for some time. But around two, uh, I think around two, 2013, 2014, some of the community members started to revive it um, and remake the masks, these masks, to reconstruct these masks and, and sort of develop them and paint them. And, uh, and they're really quite amazing. Uh, I'll show you the inside of one in a moment. But you can see some of the same material here. We have the kera all rolled up here. We have the, um, the knives. These knives are made of wood, so don't worry, they're not real. But, um, and there's, there's the mask. And there's the inside of the mask. And it's, it's wonderful to see how well constructed it is. There's, uh, it's made of what, whoops, sorry about that. What's called a, a, a zaru or saru, which is a, um, a, a, a strainer, a kind of bamboo uh, strainer that's used for cooking and for um, uh, draining noodles and that sort of thing. So it's quite large. And inside is a catcher's mask. So uh, this is a, a, obviously a fairly modern version um, but it really makes it a lot more comfortable to wear, right? So they've, they've embedded it in there in a really, really nice way. Um, the night of Namahage, the night of New Year's Eve, uh, young men, the people involved in this group, gather in the community center. And he's a little bit bigger than the one I showed you earlier. And uh, this is, he's the leader of this small group of men. Uh, this guy's actually a, a professional butcher. He's, he's, um, his shop is just down the street, but he's the leader of this group. And he's giving them assignments. and. They're getting ready. You can see them getting dressed here. Again, very similar to what we saw before. Uh, and this community still has a lot of young men. Sometimes they come home from college and participate in this. Um, and there's uh, actually, that's, that's me trying on the costume. <laughs> um, and uh, in this case, it's also a, a shrine. Now, now, Namahage's relationship to religion is very complex and it's not explicitly considered a religious festival but in many ways, it's tied up with vernacular religion and religious practices within the community. In this case, before they go on out to the houses, a priest, a Shinto priest from the local shrine will come and he will bless the masks and the equipment, and he will also uh, bless the participants. Um, and it's a, you know, so in other words, they've got the blessing of the deity of the kami, as it's called, uh, to go out and perform this, this service, as it were, for the community. Uh, and here they are ready to go. And they also have a quick drink of what's called omiki. It's a little glass of sake. That's a, a kind of purification ritual. It also, in some ways, I think, gets them ready for the adventures, which you know are quite, quite blustery and they need to uh, have a lot of energy. Unfortunately for this presentation, I don't have any audio. Um, but I, if you're interested, if you go online, you'll be able to find sometimes uh, some recordings of, of the sounds of the Namahage. They're very loud and raucous and, and somewhat rough in some, 
some cases. So it's, it's a very strenuous job to be an amahage. In this case, they go from house to house, come inside and you see these big masks, right? It's inside, that's really kind of intimidating. And they scare the little kids. Um, and just generally cause, cause raucous uh, problems. Some, sometimes kids are very scared, especially when they're very little. They have no idea what's going on. Um, and older kids, of course, realize that this is, you know, so-and-so's big brother or whatever. And here's a kid taking a selfie with the namahage, right? So it, even for, for the older kids and the family members, it's, it's a, a, a very special moment of kind of blessing and, 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 and uh, excitement. Uh, even if they know that that it's all kind of a subterfuge and there's people dressed up in there. So this is one community. This particular community is uh, done in such a way that they don't stay for very long. They just um, come inside, scare people and run off. Other communities are a little bit different. So this is another one that I went to, a very, very small community, about 200 people in the entire village or the entire neighborhood. And it's somewhat isolated from the other neighborhoods in Oga. By neighborhood, I mean, a, it's kind of a, a hamlet, a little country village area. And as you can see, a lot of these participants are much older. And that's because there simply are not that many young people living in this community anymore. It's very agricultural and it's hard to make a living. Uh, so a lot of them have left. You can also see, and here they are preparing. Um, you can also see the masks are very different here, very bright color. And in this particular community, which was wonderful for me uh, trying to take pictures, they actually start early in the afternoon uh, or about four o'clock in the afternoon when it's still light. And one reason they do that, I discovered when I traveled with them from house to house, uh, here, they, here they are, they go to the local shrine and pray before they begin. Then they go in a truck because it's a little bit big. It's the Namahage truck. Um, and sometimes they walk through the streets, but they go into houses and unlike what we just saw, they really they sit down, they settle in, they go in a big group and they're served alcohol and food. There's certain, depends on the community, but there's kind of uh, special local foods. There's a fish called hata hata, which is really localized to that region. It's considered a kind of ceremonial dish in this context. Um, and they're served food and they hang out, they drink, they lift their mask up to drink. Um, what I noticed in this particular community, there weren't that many kids. So really they're visiting the household is more of a blessing for the household itself. And they would spend some time with their neighbors and friends. And it was almost like a roving, uh, roving house party. It was really kind of interesting. Um, and you, know, you can see how they're sort of the honored guests in, in the village. And it's also really nice in a community sense that often it's older people serving younger people, right? So some of the, the tables are turned in terms of hierarchical structure in this context. Uh, here we are again with them posing for pictures. The, the next, or a couple of years later, I had the chance to go to a place called Matsukizawa. Um, again, we see a very, very different kind of procedure here. This is a really small community, about 100 people, essentially one street running through the center of town. Uh, and in this case, there are very few people, uh, very, about seven or eight uh, young men involved in, in the organization. And here they are, they have very old masks. They only have two, there's one pair. Um, they're actually made of clay, reinforced. Uh, actually, I think with some fiberglass. And they've been around since the 1950s. Uh, before they go, they climb up the stairs, steep stairs to a shrine and they uh, pray to the deities there saying, we're about to make the rounds of the houses. And they come down and you can see it's, it's cold and blustery. And they walk from house to house and inside the houses, um, same kind of thing occurs, the family. And in, in this particular community, and I'd never seen this before, and I'd asked a lot of my inter interlocutors who know a lot more about Namahage than I do, and they say, that as far as they know, this is the only community where they do this, they rub the knife on the top of the head of people in the house as a kind of blessing, a good luck charm. Um, and I asked about this, and nobody really knew the origins, but in this particular community, they, they had done that for many years. Uh, so that was really interesting, again, to see the variety involved. Um, and here too, they sit down and have a drink or two. And the older, here's a, uh, I think she was a college age kid or about to go off to college. And, you know, she knew this was 
the older brother of her best friend from next door, that kind of thing, right? So, so they know who they are. So they were having fun with that as well. So those are just a, a lot of examples of what happens on New Year's Eve. For various reasons, for various reasons, um, the, this became somewhat famous throughout Japan. Um, and after World War II and, and into the 50s and 60s, it was, it was a known, a, a strange, quirky, interesting ritual that was known throughout Japan. And people, to a certain extent, wanted to see it. And at the same time, the community itself was undergoing a great deal of uh, depopulation. Um, this is a time of what's known in Japan as, as a time of high economic, rapid economic growth, right? And people were moving to the cities. And, uh, and people from this community were moving to the city, so it was becoming depopulated, and they were losing their, their economic viability. So this kind of combination of events um, com occurred during the 1960s, and, and, and there was an idea in the community, let's use Namahage to attract people, but we don't want them to come into our houses, right? So, so essentially, the, the images I just showed you were me, you know, sort of invading someone else's houses. Of course, I, you know, this, after many years, I have a lot of connections there and I was able to get the permission of, of everybody involved, but it would be hard to do that on a tourist level, right? So they came up with a brilliant idea to create a festival, um, a separate festival, and they called it Namahage Sedo Matsuri. So everything I've just showed you takes place on New Year's Eve, but the Namahage Sedo Matsuri um, was started in 1963, officially, and it's held on the grounds of a large shrine called the Shinzan Shrine. I'll show you a, a picture of the grounds in a moment. Uh, it's held every year in mid-February. So it's a time when nobody else, who would wanna go to the snowy area in the middle of February? So it's a great way to, for them to attract tourists and people to come in. It's three days in a row uh, in the evening. So, so it's, about from, uh, it's about from six o'clock to eight o'clock every evening for three nights in a row. Approximately 1,500 visitors come each day. And uh, it takes place in mid-February, so it's, it's completely separate from what we've just which watched, but it draws on that as a cultural resource and identity. Um, I'm, I'll skip that part. Um, let me just go right into the festival, actually. Here's um, the one thing I do want to uh, stress about the festival is that festivals are complex, right? The ritual that we just watched that takes place on New Year's Eve is, you know, there's a lot of complexity involved in that, but the, this festival has a lot of different elements and I'll just try to introduce a few of them. First of all, it takes place on these snowy grounds here. So it's a much larger area. Uh, preparation, it's called the Namahage Sedo Matsuri. Sedo in this case is a local term for this, this fire actually. Uh, so they create this fire and they prepare. And then you can see at night, um, you know, on a snowy, uh, night with the embers rising up here. It's quite atmospheric. People gather around the fire. Um, there's an opening ceremony in which there's 15 young men, uh, a little hard to see here, but 15 young men and uh, the priests of the a, a very large shrine here, blessing them and blessing the masks. And then there's a kind of moment of transformation where they suddenly become namahage. Uh, and then these namahage tramp up into up these stairs and further up into the hills. In the meantime, they reenact the ritual that we just witnessed, the New Year's Eve ritual, they reenact on stage. Uh, and you can see, it's a little hard to see here, but one of the reasons so hard to see is you can see how many people find this fascinating, right? So they really do get a lot of tourists. You can see the cameras, uh, people are photographing. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity for people to see this. It's a little educational, but also a, a fun experience. Um, there's also a Namahage dance, which takes place in front of that bonfire. Um, and there's Namahage daiko or, or taiko drumming, which, you know, people wearing masks and beating on drums is a pretty powerful experience to watch. And interestingly, there was never any long uh, history of taiko drumming in this community. But for this event, for this festival, it started. And now there's several drumming groups within the community that have develop because of this. Then they have what, what they call the climax, which is um, the, na the 15 Namahage who we saw transformed now are at the top of a hill holding torches. 
and posing. And it's a really kind of spectacularly photogenic uh, event. I'm not a very good photographer, so my pictures are not great. But uh, you can see how this is really kind of a, a magical experience for people watching it. And it's something that doesn't take place at all on New Year's Eve, right? They, we never see them outside on New Year's Eve. They're in the house. So this is um, kind of invented for this festival. I do, when I say it's invented or it's new, in no means am I demeaning that. I think it's a, it's a fabulous uh, use, a creative use of this resource that in itself has become a long held tradition since 1963 and it's ongoing. And in the end, um, the visitors get to take their pictures with the, uh, with the Namahage. There, there's uh, me and, and a good friend of mine from Tokyo who, who came up with me that time. Um, and you can see again how photogenic this experience is. And people will cherish these images, right, as, as their souvenir. There's another one. Um, so I'm sort of leading into the way in which that uh, Namahage is used now in the community for tourism. Uh, so one way it's done is educationally. There's actually two kind of connected museums uh, that focus on Namahage. And, and I, you know, if you ever have a chance to go to this area, I encourage you to go check out the museums, which are really quite wonderful. You can also see a reenactment of the ritual. <clears throat> and one of the interesting things, uh, I went to this, this particular museum on New Year's Eve or right before New Year's Eve. And one thing they have in the museum is a lot of mannequins, I guess, statues of Namahage in full costume show the kind of variety I've just been trying to show you as well. But what I noticed was this, some of them don't have the masks. And if anybody can read Japanese there, basically what this says is this mask is away because it's being used in the village. So the museum becomes a kind of storehouse for a lot of the masks that are actually still very much in use. So if you go around New Year's Eve, you, they've, they've taken the masks off and they're being used in the community and all you can see is, is the image there. So I, I, like, I found this really interesting, the way in which the actual continued practice of the uh, tradition is in lockstep with the demonstration and exhibition of the tradition at the same time. Um, also, Namahage has become a local icon. Uh, wherever you go in Oga, you see signs like this. I, I, and I personally, I love it. Welcome to Oga. You know, it's very inviting in, in, in a very ironic way, right? Um, so you see these images all over. This is a souvenir store. And, you know, these, these you know, welcome to our store, buy something with us. Um, this is a, a, a rental uh, car shop. And here, it's a little hard to see, but the bathroom of a gas station, the male and female namahage are being used to indicate the bathroom. Here's a monopoly board. Now, this is not for Oga. This is broader Akita prefecture. So, you know, this a city as opposed to a state level. And they have a blue and red namahage at, on, the, on the local version of the uh, monopoly board. Uh, all kinds of charms. This is a, a Hello Kitty wearing a namahage mask. Um, so people have really sort of commodified the, uh, the image. Um, this is a post box and then a bobblehead. I, I, I love, uh, here's my own bobblehead. Um, and as you enter the community, if you drive into the community, the main road leading into the Oga Peninsula, there are these, for the last, I think they put them about 20 years ago, these gigantic statues. Uh, and these are about 15 meters tall. You can see there's a telephone pole right next to them. These have become a tourist site in themselves for people who don't even bother going to Oga. This is a rest stop and they have their picture taken with these, these giant things. Uh, and I think part of it is there's a sort of local community idea. And here's an image um, from the city that says literally something like sending the spirit of Namahage throughout the country. So they want it to be known as a special thing that takes place there and is shared with the rest of the country and is, and is valuable in that way. Um, so that gets me to this notion of, of UNESCO and ICH. Um, UNESCO, as you all probably know, is the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. In 2003, uh, UNESCO created something called the uh, Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage. Um, and I, I won't go into details about this. There's been a lot of stuff written about this, particularly by folklorists and anthropologists. Um, but essentially, as part of this, 
just like we have World Heritage Sites, sites that are uh, selected and inventoried and labeled as somehow uh, representing the heritage of the world. In this case, they're looking at intangible things, things like traditions, customs, practices, ways of making things, ways of doing things. And they put some of these on what's called the representative list of the intangible heritage uh, intangible cultural heritage of humanity. And you can look this up, it's on the UNESCO website and it's, it's wonderful to see what every country has nominated and had selected. And there's, um, so I won't get into any of the details. I'm happy to answer questions about this in the past, in a, in a Q and A. Uh, this is one thing I hadn't expected to become interested in when I first started this research, but inevitably the traditions that I've worked with have been involved in this list. So in 2017, the Japanese government, the Japanese Agency of Cultural Affairs nominated for this list. So it has to be nominated by the country, sent to UNESCO and then approved and then added, inscribed on the list is what they say. Uh, they nominated something called Dai Hoshin, Ritual Visits of Deities in Masks and Costumes. This is 10 separate traditions, but related, separate but related. Um, and they were nominated in 2017 and inscribed by UNESCO in 2018. And one of those, the most famous of them all, was Oga no Namahage. So Namahage of Oga in Akita uh, Prefecture. So that was inscribed on the list. Uh, one of the things that I've been interested in is how this changes what people think about it and how they enact it. So in other words, the relationship between the intensely local and the global, right? So, uh, and you can sort of see that playing out in a number of ways. And if this was just a few years ago, so there's not much uh, evidence of it, but first of all, the newspapers reported, this is just a, a newspaper report right after the inscription and it has all 10 of them. One of the things I noticed about the newspaper reports that was interesting is Namahage is clearly the most famous of these. Um, another one that I study is called Toshidon and that's not as famous. So Namahage in this context was always written at the top. It said Namahage and similar traditions, right? Um, so the people in the community were very proud of this, of course, and excited. And one of the things that they started to do was um, sort of reinvigorate the, uh, it, was a, it was a very strong um, ritual, but reinvigorate it a little bit so that even on New Year's Eve, um, some people will come on New Year's Eve and during the day, New Year's Eve day, they now have a procession through the center of town. And here's Namahage going in the procession and literally being led through the town. I, I love this, it's like the Abbey Road, you know, uh, crosswalk thing. Um, so crossing the street and they go to the Oga uh, train station where there's a lot of tourists and, and people waiting to greet them and take their pictures. Uh, and then the Namahage will actually go out onto the tracks. This is the platform of the train station and greet the trains as they come in. Uh, so it's kind of this, and this is all really very new. Um, I think it's, it's slightly before the actual nomination or the inscription of the, uh, of the ICH. And what I love about this picture too is that you can actually see that they're using, this is the sign that indicates that this is Oga. And on the sign is an image of a Namahage. And here are the, the real Namahage next to them. Um, one of the other things that's actually really moving to me was this inscription has also inspired local communities to become, to sort of revitalize their own small Namahage ritual. So this is a small town, a small community called Shimachi, probably about a hundred community members. And from what I understand in Shimachi, they had had a tradition of Namahage that 20 years ago, people had sort of lost interest in and had fallen by the wayside. The mask was broken and it was just stored away uh, in, a, in a community center closet somewhere. So in 2018, um, the se several families in the communities thought, let's revive this, let's revitalize this for our own children. These were young families. Uh, this woman in particular, who's an art student, or an art, uh, had studied art. She's, she's, she's not a student anymore. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. She went and she found the mask and she fixed it up and she redid it. And you can see how beautifully redone it is here. 
Um, it's also made of a zaru, um, a, a, a kind of bamboo strainer, but they've put in some, you know, some cushioning and all that sort of thing here. And it's a very small community. They, these were the only people involved. In this case, two women in particular took, were the, you know, the forces behind it. Um, and they have three masks and their brothers and husbands basically are wearing the masks and they walk from house to house in this very small community and are welcomed. There are very few kids in this community at this point, but they're welcomed very gratefully by the older people in the community who remember this tradition from when they were kids uh, and are really uh, inspired by seeing these younger people doing it. One of the things that I learned in this visit from 2019 was that there were at least five different communities that had been directly inspired by the UNESCO inscription to revitalize their own local tradition. So I found that a really interesting turn of events, the way, again, the global and the local are interacting in a kind of exciting way. Um, and here you see the same kind of thing. And then finally them posing back afterwards, they posed for the picture for me. Um, and that's it. That's I wanted to end on that sort of uplifting note. I hope you know th this last year has been very challenging for everywhere in the world, but particularly for this kind of tradition. And my understanding is during the COVID moment um, from 20, uh, uh, this, this past, uh, was it 2020, I guess, New Year's Eve, in many places, many places, Namahage was canceled. In some places, young men would actually uh, walk through the village uh, yelling, wearing a Namahage costume and yelling, COVID be gone. Right, so as a kind of blessing and hopeful, um, you know, getting rid of the bad, bad energy of the last year and hoping for something new. So they adopted uh, adopted the situation in various different ways. Um, but I'm excited to see how it changes and flourishes going forward. Anyway, uh, if I, I know there's a lot in there, and I was very quick. If anybody's really interested, here's a few articles that I've I've written on it. And um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions now. And let me just stop sharing here. Okay, we have a couple of questions. I'm going to backtrack um, through the chat. And early on, there was a question um, asking about clarification about New Year's Eve. So are we talking about December 31st? Or are we talking about the Lunar New Year? Um, and were um, dates different before uh, Japan transitioned from the Gregorian calendar or to the Gregorian calendar rather? That's, that's a wonderful question. And uh, it's a really complicated question. Um, Japan has had before the Gregorian calendar, which was uh, which it adapt, adopted, I think in 18, officially 1873, I'm not sure the exact date. Um, before that, they had actually a complicated mixture of a, it was called a lunar solar calendar. Um, as far as Namahage was concerned, however, it, from all I can tell, most records show that it was usually actually performed on what's called Koshogatsu, which is often translated as the Little New Year, which is around January 15th, around January 15th. But uh, at, as far as I know now, all versions of Namahage are now performed on December 31st, and that those the last holdouts were probably in the 1980s. And then everything converted to December 31st. In part, there's a really practical reason for that. And that's because uh, so many people have moved out of the community that the only time they can come home is over the New Year's break in Japan. And the New Year's break is now the Gregorian calendar, New Year's, uh, no, December 31st. So they come home for that. They can't stay till January 15th. So all Namahage now, when I, when I say New Year's Eve, I, I'm talking about um, January, uh, December 31st. And even, you know, if we talk about about 100 years ago, it was either December 31st or January 15th. Great, thank you. Okay, um, another question is about Setsubon. Is there a relationship um, to Setsubon? A, a great question, and Setsubun, for those who, who don't know, is an um, event, event that takes place uh, usually around February 3rd, February 2nd, um, 
And that actually is, is keyed into um, a lunar new year cycle. It's the day be as the, it, it's kind of the day before the first day of spring. And in that ritual, uh, people dress as demons. Well, the, the ritual as it takes, it takes place in different ways in different contexts, but, but the sort of family version of it is kids will run around the house throwing beans and saying out with the demons in with good luck, good fortune. Um, and there's various places in which it's actually enacted with people wearing costumes and whatnot. But uh, so it, it's not directly related to Namahage. At least the people who do Namahage uh, say that it's not related. Let's put it that way. They don't look at it as a, having a direct relationship. Uh, I think if we were to go back far enough in history, cer certainly in a kind of cognitive sense, the idea of cleaning out the badness before the new year begins and using uh, demonic looking creatures to do that is certainly related. I think that's certainly related. But as far as it being historically related, I think if we went back and traced the origins of Namahage, which we can't do exactly, there's all sorts of theories about it, but there probably is some kind of connection between those ideas, but there's nothing sort of documented about that that's clear cut. And the people performing it now try to keep it separate. There's always a, con a, a discussion about whether Namahage are oni, are they demons? or are they gods, right? And, and there's, there, you know, everybody's got their own opinion about it and, and a different way of interacting. That's why I usually call them demon deities when I speak about them in English, because they clearly have both aspects of those characters in them. But that's a wonderful question. And, and I think uh, just to add a little bit to it, the, the, the Matsuri in February, I think one reason it's attractive in February is because of that potential association with Setsubun as well. Yeah, great. And there's also, I'm going to just jump the line because there was a related question about how, you know, something like an Oni or Namahagi is like a demon. How did that whole event become something or how did he get involved or it become involved, you know, in a blessed event? And so, yeah, there's that balance, right? Of yeah. And that, and that's, you know, it's, this is something that in, in my broader research, I'm really interested in understanding how, how the scary and the demonic is also, you know, a sacred and protective thing, right? And we get that even with, you know, the, the notion of a gargoyle. Um, and, and in Japanese also, there's what's known as onigawara, which is a, a demon-faced uh, roof tile, right? Um, I think you, you probably have some in your, in the exhibition, Felicia, I don't know, but... Um, we don't. <laughs> oh, we don't, okay. Um, we, we actually have... Um, uh, copies of them. We had them made from um, styrofoam, though, and, you know, have them as design elements, but we don't actually have Onigawara in the exhibit. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, but, but that, that sort of, that really complex ambiguity is something that uh, is really, is hard to flesh out, and I think it's, it's found in a lot of religious traditions, cer certainly um, in Asian religion traditions, in, in Buddhism, um, a lot of uh, certain deity figures are frightening and scary, but that doesn't mean that they're bad. They're also protective, right? So the Namahage is, 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 is in that ambiguous area. Historically, now there's all sorts of legends about the origins of Namahage, which I, I didn't talk about at all, but one of them is this kind of, um, one of the, the one that's kind of taken hold as the most frequently articulated legend posits that there was a that the Namahage were demons from China. There were five of them that were brought over um, and, and, and put to work in the hills, um, building things. And, and that they, you know, the, the tension of being made to work the whole time, made, they, they went wild and they rampaged through the villages at one point. And then the community made a deal with them. And they said, listen, um, we'll let you do whatever you want in the village if, you can do one thing for us. And that one thing is if you can build a stone stairway with a thousand steps up to this um, shrine that we have in the mountains, if you can do that in one night, then we'll let you have free reign. But if you can't, then you have to promise to leave us alone. So the demon said, okay, we'll give it a try. And they're, you know, they're, they're demons, so they're very powerful. And they brought all the stones and they were, they were making incredibly good progress. And they had one step left to go and the villagers were, were very upset and thought, what, what do we do? So they got one of their fellow villagers who's particularly good at imitating the crow of a rooster 
and he, he crowed like a rooster, the demons being demons and not necessarily all that intelligent as the story says, um, they realized the sun was coming up and they had failed, even though they were duped into doing this and they gave up and they now as a kind of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a kind of remembrance and memorialization of this experience and the deal that was made, they come down just this one night a year to frighten kids and remind them of it. A lot of it, of course, as you all know from, from folklore, a lot of these legends and, and the sort of rationale behind them don't necessarily uh, lock in completely logically with how things are played out. But that's one of the stories that is, is most commonly articulated about the origins of Namahati. That's really interesting. Do you, do you know if there's any connection, um, like in other traditions um, in Asia, there are deities that are really fierce and frightening um, and they come across that way to frighten off the negative uh, energy or you know, uh, bad spirits and, and that sort of thing. So is there any connection to that, do you think? Yeah, I think, I, again, I don't know if it's, it's, it's not kind of a codified connection, but certainly in, in spirit, as it were, that's exactly what they do, right? They come in and, and they're not, yeah, they're not, they're, they're scaring the kids, but what they're doing essentially is scaring the laziness out of the kids and scaring the bad behavior out of the kids, right? So there's a kind of cleansing attitude towards it. And, and, and that's part of it as well. I think that's a really good way to think about it. Yeah. Okay. So um, another question um, from early on, someone mentioned, and I'm going to have to look into this. It sounds really cool. Um, there's a Netflix movie right now um, and it's from Japan called, um, are there any crybabies here? Do you oh. heard of that? I, you know, that, yes. And and um, I haven't seen it. I didn't know it was on Netflix right now. I've been sort of following the production of that. That, from what I understand, takes place in Oga and is oh. is based on that. I, whoever saw that, I, I don't know. Uh, if That was Martin McKellar. I don't know if he wants to shout out or make a comment, but yeah, that sounds cool. Oh, okay. Martin, was it good? <laughs> Uh, I didn't know it was available. I have to watch that. I've noticed in the Japanese press that I've seen that it was out, but I thought I would have to wait a, a few years till I get back to Japan to see it. But um, that's fantastic. It's available on Netflix. Yeah, I'm going to watch it tonight. Okay. Um, and any relationship to the Tengu festivals? Um, there are different fest Tengu festivals in different parts of Japan um, where men dress up as Tengu and go around. Um, and in um, this person, this was Samantha and her experience. Um, she said that the, the Tengu hit kids on the head with a baton for good luck, um, and sometimes they got the adults too. Um, I don't, I don't, there's, there's no, it's, it's a really good question. It, it's really hard to find explicit connections with other festivals, and I would argue that probably not, but certainly there's there can also be mutual influence, and the idea behind it seems very sim similar. The Tengu is a slightly different kind of creature, as it were, the yokai, but often also associated with um, with mountains and with with religion to a certain extent. And so that sounds like a very viable kind of connection. But as far as the historical connections are concerned, I, I don't think there are. Um, I should say Tengu are also related to uh, sh often uh, uh, associated with Shugendo practices, which is mountain asceticism. Um, and the Namahage, the mountains where the Namahage are sometimes said to live on Oga Peninsula, also historically have been associated with um, uh, Shugendo practices. So there's a connection along those ways as well. But as far as a distinct connection between those festivals, there's nothing that I've ever heard about. But thank you. Thank you for answering that. That was my question. Oh, OK. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Um, also in the chat, and this is sort of related and um, maybe just more like commentary um, that you might uh, be interested if you missed it, Michael, but um, people were also commenting that there are similarities um, that they've noticed between what you were talking about and things like the Chinese lion dance, which are scary, but they hand out treats. Um, and then something about the um, winter months, like Ottawa's winter loot. It reminded, you know, of that kind of um, time or maybe a kinder, gentler uh, Krampus. 
Mm -hmm. um, and even the Tibetan dance masks, like the, the Cham, Cham dance uh, masks, uh, they found, people found similarities there. Yeah, and, and you know, this is something, I, again, and I should have mentioned this, but one of the things about this research that I find so fascinating and, um, and mysterious are, are the connections between this ritual and, you know, Krampus is a great example, but all across Europe, there are winter, even, even Santa Claus, right? Um, it's, it's been sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say it's been, it's been cleaned up in a lot of ways in the American context, but historically often, you know, Santa Claus was, was a, a, accompanied by a demonic figure of some sort or Santa Claus, you know, that, that whole history is very, very similar to the kind of thing that's happening here. Something called Sylvester Clausen, um, where, you know, in mumming traditions, all of these are somehow related. How they're related uh, is, is very, very hard to, to understand. And I, 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 it's something that I've always been struggling with because they're not, many of them are not historically related, right? There's, there's probably no direct connection between Namahage and Krampus in terms of a traceable line where one influences the other. But there's something going on that's, that's occurring at similar times of the year Right, these transitional moments, often in the dead of winter, um, and from one year to a new year, right, and and there are these vulnerable moments of transition where a demonic figure of some sort uh, is is transgressing the threshold of the household or the village or whatever, right, um, and this is is kind of a, a shadow behind all the research I've been doing recently is trying to figure that out, and if anybody has any uh, deeper understandings of it, please share it with me because I'd I'd love to understand it more fully, but, but it, and even I think, uh, yeah, m many, many different cultures have something similar to this. P.S. Um, Martin McKellar says that he has not seen the movie yet. Oh, okay. Um, looking forward to it also. And I'm going to try and get through a couple of um, questions that I pulled off the chat, and then we're going to try and turn to the audience and let people ask their own questions. Sure, sure. But, um, Okay, uh, some questions about the symbolism. Can you talk about the staff and the other kinds of accoutrement and what that is and what it means, as well as um, the meaning of the blue and red mask? Um, they're sort of seen in pairs. So, you know, um, what is what is that? Okay, that that's a that's a, a a lot of cans of worms, and it's very complicated. I'll preface it by saying that. Every, as I hope came across, every small community has its own slightly different tradition and, and slightly different rendering of the symbolism. Um, the staff, which uh, is, is, that's a staff that's very, actually very uh, similar to a Shinto uh, ritual object. Uh, it has what's called gohe, those white papers, and it's, it's a kind of ritual blessing staff. It, it's a purification um, instrument. The knives that they hold, and there's a, whole, a very interesting story behind the knives. Um, so one of the, the sort of uh, conventional wisdom about the origins of the word namahage is that in the local slang, there was something, the local dialect, there was something called a namomi. And nam, namomi refers to a blister that develops on uh, the legs, on your legs, from, and there's actually a technical word, I think it's cutis mama, I, I, I don't know the technical uh, Latin phrase for this, but uh, it's actually a medical condition of some sort that's, it's a red blister that develops on the legs when sitting too close to a hearth for too long, right? So some kind of irritation. And that, not, so that's a namomi. And then tori hagu or ha, hagasu is the action of cutting that off. So the namahage, in this rendition of the, the, the origins comes from namomi o hage toru, to cut off your namomi with a knife. The meaning, the, the sort of implication being that if you're sitting by the hearth for too long in the winter, it means you're lazy. Uh, it means that you, you should be out working or you should be doing something else. And it's, you know, in, and, but of course the winter for an agricultural community is the time you wanna sit home and stay warm and, and preserve your energy. But, but the, in, the, the sort of idea behind it is don't be lazy. I'm gonna cut off these symbols of your, your laziness as it were. And that's why sometimes Namahage will also have buckets 
So they cut them off and they put it in the buckets. There's all kinds of semi legends that associate with like it, it gives, they take it back and eat it and gives them power or something. But, but these are th that, these are sort of additives to, to the legends. It's a little hard to historically trace them, but, but sometimes people will say that kind of thing. So that's part of the symbolism. Um, as far as the coloration of the masks, this gets really quite complex, but in many communities, there's a red and blue or sometimes a, a green and red. And oddly enough, um, it's all, the performers are always men, but some, in some communities, the Namahage themselves are gendered and the blue are considered to be female and the red are considered to be male. Um, there doesn't, from everybody I've spoken to, I can't find an explanation of why this might be the case or what it matters, their behavior is the same. So their actual behavior on the ground is, is, is pretty much the same. But for some reason, there was this idea that it was important to pair them off. And in some places, for example, if you remember the Anzenji place, that was those uh, silver and gold masks that uh, the, the photographs from the daytime, though there's six masks and each one of them is actually named. Um, so each one has a name. Uh, some are male, some are female. And, you know, I, I asked about, you know, is there a personality associated with it? And there really isn't, but there's sort of, it's kind of a fun name given to this and there's sort of silly names. I, I don't have the names offhand, but they, they're not like normal human names associated with the masks. So there's a kind of um, almost as, you know, you're taking that role. You're not just playing a Namahage, you're playing a specific kind of Namahage. And in some cases, again, to use another specific, if you remember the uh, village of uh, Matsuzaki, um, oh, I'm sorry, Matsukizawa, where um, there were the, just the two namahage, kind of a greenish and a red namahage. Their kera, the costumes they wear, are actually tied differently depending on whether it's male or female. Uh, and that's the only place I've ever seen them take care to do that. But again, their behavior is the same. So it's a really, it's kind of, so whoever asked that question, it's a great question and it's a huge question. It's a huge question. I should say, I've, I've been trying to write about Namahage and I've written a few articles about it, um, but I realized it's, I, I ended up, I'm, I'm about a quarter of the way through a book. And what I'm afraid is I'm gonna write this huge book answering all these questions and nobody's gonna to wanna to read it because it's really only interesting when you're, when you're really obsessed with it like I've, I've become. Um, but there are so many other questions that, that come up and it, it's, it's hard to, uh, you've really got to track them all down. And there's, there's a lot of, each question brings up a whole nother set of questions, of, of deeper questions behind it. So. Yeah, and that sounds like a good book to me. And I, I hope you <laughs> follow through with that because I think there's a lot of people that would be really interested in those kinds of details. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the, you talked about it's usually men that dress up as namahagi, and um, how are they chosen, or do they volunteer? Um, and um, yeah, I think that uh, there were a couple of questions around that. Yeah, so that's that's a great question as well, and that also uh, that the answer to that question sort of reflects the changes that have happened in the community over over many years. So. My understanding is that historically, it was really considered an honor to take on the role of the Namahage. And what they, they used to have what they called young men's associations in these small communities, still sometimes have them. And there's a group, groups of young men anywhere between the ages of, I'll probably get this wrong, 14 and, and 40. Um, and these were often young un, unmarried men who would be part of this community. And uh, the older ones would, sort of select the younger ones to bec become the next generation of Namahage. So there's kind of a passing of the baton. And there's, as you could see in some of those pictures, also the older men helping the younger ones. And it didn't, I didn't show this in the images, but often even now, there's some really young kids, you know, 14, you know, 13, 14 uh, years old who kind of hang out with the entourage and, and play a role in it, helping out and sometimes going to the household and knocking on the door and saying the Namahage are on, on their way. Um, so there's a kind of gradual moving into the position. So it was considered an honor to do that. More and more, um, there's a problem with having 
enough people of the right age who are interested in, in, in being part of it. So, uh, so it's, I think, less selective, but it's, you know, voluntary and, and people, and you really have to be from the community. Um, so, and having said that, I, I want to qualify that also. There's one community, I, I didn't have a chance to visit, it, but I think a couple of years ago, they started something where they had exchange students from uh, foreign countries, in many cases, from non-Japanese places coming and participating. They would sort of train them. But I think in some cases, they told them not to say anything, just to wear the mask, right? Because you're wearing the mask, nobody can tell that you're, you're not necessarily fluent in the local, not only fluent in, in Japanese, but in the local dialect, right? So, uh, so that, and that was a little bit controversial, but there is a little bit of a problem finding people in some cases to continue the tradition. I will mention one other thing, it's not directly related to this, but it's, I think, a really weird but brilliant thing that the community has done. Uh, they created a system probably about 13 or 14 years ago called the Namahage Dendoshi uh, system. Dendoshi is a, is a weird word, but it's kind of a, um, it, it implies uh, somebody like a missionary or a disciple. Uh, and what this is, is a people from outside of the community will go and study Namahage for about two days and receive a license at the end if they pass the test. That allows them to be kind of an ambassador for speaking about Namahage. Uh, and this system exists in various communities. I, I think there's something like this in the city of Kyoto, for example, where people will be trained and it's quite rigorous to know all the temples and shrines. And then they can become not necessarily a formal guide, but a somebody who can speak knowledge, knowledgeably about it. And this is what happens with Namahage. And it's a brilliant system. So every year uh, between I think 40 and 80 people will come spend a couple of days, I think it's in November, studying and then taking this test. So, uh, and I was at a meeting of some of these dendoshi at one point and they were really, they were asking like, now that we're you know, ambassadors of Namahage, can we be Namahage? And it was a somewhat controversial question. And I think, I, you know, it's up to the individual community. A lot of communities are very conservative and only want their own people. Others are much more open and, and want to continue the tradition at whatever, whatever changes are necessary to incorporate. So anyway, another great question. Yeah, we have some really great questions here. Um, so it's not an obligation though for people to, you know, participate. It's it's more of um, a voluntary thing. And at yeah. what age around is that switch? Like, you know, maybe, you know, it's like, you know, people here might have a certain age where they want to tell their kids about Santa Claus. Is there a certain age where like, you know, families tell their kids about, um, Namahagi, and then when those kids then become Namahagi? You know, that, that's a great question too. And, and it, it really, again, it varies from place to place. I think though, it's, it's not very old, you know, probably by the time a kid is uh, six or seven years old, they're starting to realize that it's, it's kind of a weird vessel, but it's still frightening, right? It's still, uh, even if you know it's, it's, you know, your big brother's best friend, it's scary to have somebody yelling at you and um, and coming in and, and and causing a commotion. So there's but there's no formal kind of coming out uh, ceremony or like you know this is what this is the truth behind the mask. Um, it just gradually I think gets revealed. Um, I will say uh, this is not Namahage, but there's another tradition that I've also studied that's very similar in a lot of ways in very different place, um, and it's actually in some ways even more intense in the fact that they try to hide their identities. And in that community, um, kids until the age of nine or 10, they, they, they are pretty sure it's not a God or a demon, but they don't know who it is. And they're really kind of scared until, and then it's, even after it's revealed, they're a little bit hesitant. So it really depends on the age. In the case of Namahage, I think it's probably around six, seven, eight that they start really cottoning on and it's not as powerful. As you, you saw one of those pictures, there was a little kid pouring uh, pouring beer for or, or sake for the namahage and and they so they start taking a role in doing that at sort of acting you know serving the adults as it were and they're still scared but they're not they're not screaming and crying right so right right things have calmed down a bit for them okay so i'm going to switch over now if um mark bender is still in the room um he had a question about um or a comment about uh, an experience and some things that he's seen um, in China. 
Are you still here? I see his name. Mark, un unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, hi, good to see you. Um, yeah, I was in uh, uh, western, uh, eastern Guizhou province in an area called Tongren back in the early 90s. And I, uh, as part of the New Year's festival, they had these groups of young men who were sort of associated with a local temple that had been revived into a kind of a cultural center. And they had all these uh, null wooden masks uh, on display and so forth. And in the evening, these young men uh, went around with these uh, um, sort of uh, baton type things with little shakers on them and are doing these dances. It was interesting that you that it reminded me that some of these were dressed as, as, as males in a kind of a costume, clown-like costume, and others were dressed up to be uh, female flower fairies who, wow. were, uh, who were, were dancing around. And it's interesting that this uh, community was there in the mountains and they had these very elaborate stone steps that you know went up and down throughout uh, the community. It's practically what you're talking about in, in the story. So there's some really inter interesting parallels came to mind uh, with that. But I think that this uh, idea of the uh, young man you know, dressed up in some fashion going around to each house and, and doing this uh, sort of uh, uh, crazy dance thing. Uh, there seems to be some sort of, uh, you know, in this general thing that we've been talking about. I'm not yeah, sure it, if it's still going on today, but that's what I saw at that moment. It'd be, it'd be fascinating to find out. I mean, it's certainly connection. I mean, there's no question there's connections and maybe even historical connections to things in, in China, I think, in this context. But I think what one of the things that I find, you know, uh, um, the sort of function of this within the community and within sort of the hierarchical relationship between community members is also really fascinating because in a kind of strict um, uh, agricultural community and hierarchical situation, young men, you know, should be behaving their parents, right? But in, in this context, the, these people who may or may not even be of age to drink are being respectfully served alcohol and, and they're allowed, so it's a, there's a kind of carnivalesque and flipping of um, of hierarchical relationships. Yeah, the inversion, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which is really fantastic. And in some cases, I haven't seen this myself, but um, that uh, town of Anzenji, again, the one with the gold and silver masks. Um, I One of my uh, closest uh, sort of colleagues in, in, in this research is a photographer, a Japanese photographer who's, who's been um, taking photos of Namahage for uh, almost 40 years. and he had been to that community in the late 80s. And what he remembered was how crazy these guys were, how raucous they were, so much so that they actually pushed a minivan into a rice field. They, so, and and they, there were no ramifications of doing this because on that night they were allowed to be wild. Um, and, uh, but it like destroyed the minivan apparently. So uh, they're not that, they're not that, raucous anymore they, they they've they're a little bit under control in fact i was with some namahage once crossing the street and the driver yelled at them for not waiting for the the light to change and uh <laughs> one of the older men got very upset they're namahage they can do whatever they want right but um but so there's this there's a, a a sort of tamping down of their wildness but um but that inversion is really interesting and and they grad they also are taking on a kind of community responsibility as young men like they're they're in the in a sense employed by the community to perform this role. And there's a, a real sort of sense of pride and, and participation in it too, in a, in a lot of cases. I mean, just about that inversion too, there's another comment about the koshare um, that are, uh, they're like sacred clowns involved with um, different festivals um, in Taos um, at Taos Pueblo. And so, um, yeah, pe other people are also drawing on similarities and, and that idea of, you know, those inversion kind of um, rituals. Yeah, and again, that's something that I, I think probably happens a lot in, in changes of seasons and, and sort of in, in harvest times. And uh, so there really are a lot of similarities between these things. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for coming today. And Michael, thank you so much. This was so much fun and so interesting. And I, I just um, 
I'm really honored to be able to do this with you because it's it's always a great time to watch you speak and and hear you speak and and all that. So thank you so much. Well, thank. I just want to thank thank you, Felicia, but also thank everybody for showing up. Um, I mean, I know it's a, it's a weird experience to sit in your house and talk to so many people like this, but but it, these were wonderful questions and actually very stimulating to me. I'm going to go finish that book. Yes, you should. <laughs> and, and keep up this research. So thank you so much for coming and thanks for your wonderful questions. Yeah, and also be sure to tell um, your friends in the OGA community. Um, yes. How many people and all the questions and how interesting and uh, interested people were. So that, that'll be meaningful to us to know that that was shared with them. Um, and uh, again, our exhibition on yokai will be up at the museum on view through um, fall of 2022. And the exhibition's also online. So if you go to our website and go to exhibitions, you'll see um, an area where you can check out our online exhibits. Um, we have some great ones online, including uh, the yokai exhibit. So thank you all so much. And I'm going to um, say goodbye. Thank you.